Welcome, everybody. We're in track six, over the air and in the device. Uh, our next speaker is Matthew Rowley with How Many Bricks Does It Take to Crack a Microcell? Uh, all right, so the slides that are on the, the um, CD are not up to date. This link at the bottom has the slides in the white paper. Uh, the white paper has a little bit more detail about than what I'm going to be talking about, but if anyone wants it, it's all right there. It'll also be on the last slide of the presentation. Um, so, again, my name is Matthew Raleigh. I'm currently a senior security consultant, consultant at Matasano. Um, I typically hate when people give backgrounds on themselves before they start the presentation, but I think it's pretty applicable to my talk. Uh, it's going to go through a hardware level all the way to software level. However, my background has always been in software. So some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about in a hardware perspective may or may not use the terminology correctly, but just be a forewarning about <laughs> what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so in terms of agenda, uh, this talk is focusing strictly on the reversing from a hardware perspective all the way up to the software perspective of this specific micro cell that I was looking at. Uh, it's not focusing on any of the GSM or 3G technology, so I apologize if someone, anyone's here hoping for that. Uh, there was good talks last year on that specific case. Uh, but I'll start with the device background, then start talking about my battle with the network, uh, the communication that the device actually performs, then the cage, which is actually just the surrounding cover of the device. Then I'll get into the hardware aspects of it, talking about the debug pins on the actual device, uh, going through SPI, JTAG, serial communication that it performs, and then um, go to the so software aspect of it and looking at U-boot, some kernel reversing, firmware extraction, and binary reversing. Uh, so first, the background on this specific device. Uh, I'm assuming everyone here knows what a microcell is. It's a device that you plug into your internet connection at home and your cell phone connects to it and backhauls all of your cell communication through your network connection. So it will, instead of connect, your phone, instead of connecting to a cell tower, will connect to this device. The one in particular I was looking at had a web-based interface that was hosted on the service provider's web page. There was really no interaction that I could have with the physical device that I had uh, in my hands. The configuration was done on an external web page and then somehow pushed either to the device or pushed to, to your phone, which would allow you to connect to it. Uh, you had to provision specific phone numbers in that web page, so not anyone who just comes into my apartment would connect to it. Um, and I think there was a maximum of 15 or 20 that you could actually uh, allow to connect to your device. <clears throat> um, I started looking at this device because my cell reception was horrible in my apartment and somehow the service provider proactively sent me a card saying, hey, we noticed a lot of your phone calls are being dropped. Here's a free device if you go to the store and pick it up. Um, at the same time, I was, at this point in time, I was working at Intrepidus Group with, which focused on mobile security. So those two hand in hand kind of made sense to start looking at this device. Again, I, like I said before, I've always been a software person. Uh, so I, ShmooCon last year, uh, Stephen Ridley did a talk about hardware for software guys, which kind of also fed into this whole interest in trying to look at the hardware aspect of, of security. So it was, it was a good learning, um, learning tool for me. So the first thing that I wanted to look at when, when reversing this device was network communication. Uh, I didn't have to actually do anything physical to it. Uh, I, was, I connected the device to a server that I had in my apartment, which, with, which had two NICs, and then just monitored the communication. Uh, it doesn't have any wireless functionality in terms of Wi-Fi, so I actually had to physically connect this to a box. But looking at TCB dump, I saw HTTPS traffic, an IPsec tunnel that was initialized and uh, some multicast stuff, which I kind of just didn't think about. Uh, the next step, what, what I tried was to uh, get man in the middle of the traffic, the HTTPS traffic with Mallory, which is a software that was written in Intrepidus Group that facilitates all man in the middle communication uh, and, and manages all the certificates for you. However, it was all mutually authenticated. I couldn't get in the middle of the IPsec tunnel and the multicast stuff was kind of confusing to me. So in this case, the, the network beat me on this one. Um, I didn't gain any additional information from the device looking at the network communication traffic. It was essentially all encrypted. Uh, the next thing I started looking at was physically taking, taking the device apart or looking at the cage. Uh, this is what the device looks like. There are two screws on the bottom of, uh, on the orange panel at the bottom underneath a piece of tape. You unscrew those, the two white, that, then that 
orange panel can come off. Then the, on the sides, there's two white panels that can come off as well. And then finally, the board is actually connected to the gray part in the middle. So my idea was to unscrew it and just start pulling everything apart and seeing what, what would happen. After I did that, I tried booting it. And um, oh, this, is, this is what it looks like disassembled. Uh, you can see there's four, four panels. The board would connect in the middle of it. But after trying to boot it again, it didn't turn on. Uh, it just sat there with a light flashing. So another, this is brick number one that I had on my hands. However, I called customer support and, and tried to convince them that I had no idea what was going on. The thing just stopped working. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> So I, I ended up, after about 30 minutes of debugging the device with the first tier support, I ended up getting the customer service support people or the, the technical support people. And they, uh, they, were, they kept saying that the tamper flag was switched on their server end of things and I, or on their, on their console that they're looking at, which to me, I tried to, tried to start pushing buttons and trying to, like, try to dive further into that to see, like, hey, can you just turn the tamper flag off so it works again? And he was like, it doesn't work that way. Have you? And they kept asking me if I had dropped the device or if I had pulled it apart at all. And of course, I said no. But uh, <laughs> eventually, I ended up f pulling a story out saying that the cleaning ladies had come in the day before and they must have done something to it or it must have fallen off a, a ledge or something. So in the end, he just said, go to the store and um, you can replace it for free. We'll just give you a new one. So I went to the store, got a new one, and now it's round two against the cage. This time I was a little bit more careful. When I was pulling it apart, I noticed this, these, these sets of jumpers that were on the front and the back of the board. So there's three jumpers. This is, this, is, I, this is the back of it. But there's these three jumpers. And then that gray piece is underneath the jumpers. The jumpers are just like the things that you put in the back of a hard drive to determine if it's a master or a slave. Um, but what I didn't notice when I first took this apart was that when the, the outside white parts of that cage are actually connected with a little clip to these that gray parts. So when you pull it apart, those jumpers pop off. Um, two of the jumpers, or in my case, two of the jumpers were fake jumpers, and one of them was actually real. It completed a circuit on these two pins that were on there. So what, what I was thinking that happened is when I turned it on, it checked these jumpers to make sure that they were in the right configuration, and then it would send a signal if they weren't back to the mothership to tell them that someone's messing with this device, you shouldn't let it move forward. Um, so in order to get around this, when I was pulling off the bottom part, I, I could see like uh, a couple millimeters I had space to uh, slide something in. So I just bought this saw from Home Depot, looks like the one down there. And I started sawing through these little, this, the clip that was connected to the jumpers. I'd never seen any sort of hardware protection like this before and I was like, it, it just didn't make sense to me and, and how easy it was to get around. But I mean, obviously, they got me the first time. Um, after doing that, sawing those off, the jumper stayed on. Next time I booted it, it worked fine. I was, able to, uh, I was able to dismantle the cage and successfully boot the device on its own, uh, just as a board without anything surrounding it. So in this case, I, I, beat, the, I beat the cage finally. Uh, so this is what the, the board actually looks like. Uh, there's, uh, the, in green, there's the main components that are highlighted. It's kind of, uh, you can see it pretty well. Uh, and then in blue and red, there are these sets of um, debug pins, or what I, what I thought were debug pins that I was going to focus on first from a hardware perspective. Because again, I have no ability to communicate with this device. And everything that's happening that I could see was all encrypted. So I had to figure out some way of actually communicating with it. On the left, there's a GPS chip. Um, when you register the device on the web page, it uh, it forces you to also give a specific location of where it's going to be working for emergency 911, stuff like that. Um, and then there's a RA link in the middle, the GSM portion under that heat sink in the middle bottom, uh, XI links chip, that's a black box, and then the Pico chip on the right, which is an, under another heat sink. <coughs> so the, f the four sets, like, different sets of debug pins that I'm going to go over are just labeled. I don't know exactly what the letters and numbers mean, but that's how I reference them throughout the rest of the talk. So there's C541, JP125 and 6, PL1 and PL2. So the first set of pins that I was looking at was a CS541, which just were holes in this in the board that um, that looked like a header had just been pulled off of it uh, or just not been put into it. 
Um, and the tool that I used to actually analyze the data that was going over this is a, called a Soleil Logic Analyzer. Logic analyzer. Um, a logic analyzer is a device that you actually plug into or you, you, set, you connect to these specific hardware pins and it will sample those pins at every so, at specific intervals in time and over a specific amount of time and tell you if it's a one or a zero, basically if it's a high voltage or no voltage. And then from there it can uh, analyze that set of data and give you some, a text representation or a hex representation of what's actually being communicated over these pins. So the workflow that I was going to use in order to determine what data was going on this was first to use a multimeter to make sure that uh, once I do plug my, my, my logic analyzer into this, it's not going to blow up. It's not sending a huge um, high signal that's going to actually cause the thing to fail. Uh, from there, I was going to plug the logic analyzer into the pins, start the logic software, which runs on your computer, and then um, plug the device in. When I think data has been transmitted, stop the logic software and then try to analyze it with uh, the preset analyzers that they have built into the logic software. This is, <laughs> this is what it looks like when, uh, when you plug all this stuff in. Um, as you can see, it's, uh, it's very fun to do. Uh, this case is actually not the pins that I'm looking at now, but on this one I actually had 14 plugged into the logic. The, so, so that black box is the actual, at the top of the image is the, the actual Soleil logic analyzer that plugs into your computer and then the other side obviously plugs into the pins on the board. So after I, after I started this and was following my methodology, I see the top, which is a zoomed out version of this. Um, I was sampling at 16 megahertz, which uh, was fairly high for this amount of pins. Um, and this, the top image is of about 40 seconds of sampling, 35 seconds of sampling. As you can see, there's just these little blips that are happening in there, but when you zoom into it and the bottom, you'll see that it's just, each one of those blips is up and down, and obviously the bottom means that there's no, uh, nothing going over that pin, and on the top means that there is something going over that pin. So since there's only one, I was going through all these analyzers and knowing nothing about what any of this is, uh, I uh, eventually end up applying this async serial uh, one to it, which had a thing called auto baud, which auto automatically determined the baud rate or the the how fast the, it should be reading this. And as you can see the, on the on the the little bubbles above everything, it automatically determined that all the, there was actually data. So it's like you can see that like backslash r backslash n on the on the last part of that. So from there, I was able to export that data. Uh, into a CSV file, pulled it open into Excel, and then copied and pasted the specific pin that I was looking at into VI, and this is, and then did some manipulation so it wasn't you know one character per line, and this is what I ended up coming out with. As you can see, there's one specific string that that shows up uh, commonly through that, and that's a dollar sign GPGA two something something something. Now, after googling that, I just saw that it was GPS related data. It was, however the GPS chip was sending its coordinates to some other chip, whatever the receiving chip was. Uh, it really didn't interest me at all because I didn't, that my goal is to gain access to the device and the, the GPS stuff, whatever. However, reading on some of the forums, people were saying that it would be cool if you could use this device in other countries because then you won't have to roam. But when you try to register it or when the GPS sends back to home that you're in a different country, the thing stops working. So it's possible, uh, theoretically possible, to pull this chip off, uh, to first log all the data that's being transmitted, pull the chip off, m create something else that's just sending like your home address or your home GPS signals in the same format, and you can bring it to another country, for example, and start using your cell phone in that country. Um, I don't know if that's possible, but again, not something that I was really interested in. So in this, I, in this case, I, I learned a lot of this async serial protocol and uh, how to actually get data off of, off of these pins. However, it didn't get me any step closer to my goal of actually gaining access to the device. The next set of pins were a little bit more interesting. They looked exactly the same, um, were labeled JP1, uh, which were right next to one of the, R, the RA link chip. Uh, I did basically the same workflow that I was talking about before, plugging in the Soleil, booting it up, starting the software, and trying to analyze it. Um, this is, so this is the, the top is what, the zoomed out version of the JP1 stuff. Uh, as you can see, the bottom was what we were looking at before. As you can see, there's just like little blips over time, where as the JP1, there's this huge blob of data and then nothing. So it, it, you'll, as you'll see later on, or the next slide, that, that it, you can 
just based on the pattern of the data that's going across specific uh, debug pins, you can kind of uh, infer what, what's happening. So after pulling all that data out, I got um, this where you can see at the bottom, you can actually see it's a, a Linux boot prompt. Um, you can see, see at the bottom, it says this is ASCII Linux version 2.6.2.1, and it ended up going all the way down to a login prompt. So I was really excited here. <laughs> um, but so that eventually got me to a login prompt, and that's, this is going to be the focus of the software side of the talk. So I'm going to skip, skip over going further down into this and go to the next set of pins. But in this case, um, I, 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 got, I feel like I won this battle or this, this round. Um, the next set of pins I looked at were JP2, 5, and 6. However, there was actually no data being transmitted over them that I could see. Um, the Soleil Logic analyzer didn't, show, analyzer didn't show me anything. Um, and then, so that round was a draw. There was no show. They didn't, they didn't give me any information. Uh, the next set of pins I looked at were this PL2, which is the, the, as you can see, my soldering skills are subpar, but I was able, there's, there's two lines of seven, seven pads on this device, or on the, on the set of pins, and I, I ended up soldering wires onto it in order to connect these gator clips from the Soleil logic analyzer, and obviously use the same methodology as before, um, it's booting the device, starting the software, and this time I saw this, which was actually a lot different than, than what was seen before. The three pins were actually transmitting data out of these 14 pins, when before it was only one. So at, I, I, at ShmooCon last year, I, I met Travis Goodspeed, and I know he was really good at uh, hardware reversing. So I sent him this. I was like, have you ever seen this before? Do you have any clue what, what type of data this is? And he said, it's definitely SPI data, but started giving me some pointers. So I started researching SPI. Um, and without getting into too much detail of what SPI is, it's, it's just another communication protocol like the, the async serial protocol, and the logic analyzer has a, uh, a, an analyzer to decode this data. So these, these points are the, the key things to understanding on how you would be able to decode that data uh, that I saw on these wires. First is that SPI has the ability to transmit data up to 100 megahertz in speed. So the first thing I had to do was increase the speed of my logic analyzer sample rate. Uh, the logic, the, the actual hardware has limitations on how fast it can actually sample things, but you can configure the software to sample things quicker with less pins being connected to it. Since I only had three pins, uh, I was able to sample at 50 megahertz. So I had to, to accept a risk that poss it's possible that the data that I was getting is not going to be anything because I wasn't able to sample fast enough. Um, next is that uh, SPI uh, uh, communicates in a master slave mode and there's the ability to have multiple slaves. So you can ha actually have multiple chips communicating over one specific uh, debug pad output. Uh, there's four lines in SPI, the MOSI, which is master output slave input. I always look at things from the perspective of the master, so I just call that output, master input slave output, which is the input to the master, and then there's an enable or slave select line which will basically determine what slave you're communicating with uh, when you're actually sending data or retrieving data. Uh, and finally, there's a clock pin. And it, so in, in the async serial, the clock was at that specific baud rate. That's, that's when it knew when to sample things. With SPI, the clock is not like a metronome clock. Uh, it works in one of two different um, variations. When the clock pin goes from high to low, it will sample the other two pins, the output or the input, or vice versa when the uh, clock goes from low to high, it'll sample the other two pins and say, and so at that point in time when the clock pin changes, what, is, what are the, the output and the input pins at, either a one or a zero or a high or a low? Um, after, figure, after reading all this and understanding more about SPI, you can see zoomed in, you can, you can tell that that brown number one is the clock pin, uh, and it's going at 16 different up and downs through each blob. Uh, then the, the next one was the master output, and the following one was the master input. Uh, however, I, so this, again, you can see the, the bubbles representing the data that's above them. Um, and I, I, this specific configuration, I had it at 8 bits per, per character, or per, um, yeah, I guess, character, uh, that which is the default. However, it could be 16. I kind of spent way too much time trying to analyze that data and gave up. Um, I could see that there was data going by, but still to this day, I don't even know what that is. Uh, so in this case, the debug pins beat me. 
so then I started moving forward to the uh, another set of debug pins that look, which looked exactly the same as the last one, just in a different location on the board, which was PL1. Um, there was no data like the other pins being seen over this. However, someone at my old or at Matasano told me that these uh, scream JTAG. They look like they should be JTAG pinouts for whatever reason. Someone it was actually Cody who did a talk on Tuesday. I, I, so I started reading about JTAG, trying to figure out what what I could do to. Uh, to get some sort of data or some sort of anything from these pins. Um, the, before doing this, the only thing that I knew about, um, about JTAG was that I used this in cable modems before at a previous job to pull and push firmware. So it was my, my hopes were that I was going to be able to do this to one of the other chips on the device. Um, and the, I knew that it was some sort of standard that developers use to debug chips after a board has already been made. So again, after reading a lot about JTAG, when without going into too much detail, these are the set of points that I needed to understand in order to communicate with this chip. First is that I wasn't seeing any data because JTAG pins on their own don't transmit any data. The clock is actually outside of the JTAG ports, and that's what actually will determine if pins should be transmitting or receiving data. So you need a specific external cable. You can't just you know, plug in the Slay logic analyzer because something else needs to be triggering this clock up and down. Um, so then from there, there's five pins that, uh, that need to be connected. The VREF, TMS, TCK, TDO, and TDI, which I don't, I, I ended up figuring out what they actually meant, but at the time I was just, I was looking at pinouts and then plugging it into, oh, this is TMS, oh, that should be TMS. But there's 14 pins on these pads, so how do I know, my, my problem was how do I know which five pins should I be plugging in? Um, the next is that, like SPI, there can be multiple devices plugged into one JTAG pinout, uh, which is called, J they're, they're called, that, that, and if there are multiple devices, multiple chips connected to one pinout, they're daisy chained together. That's the terminology that they use. Uh, and then finally, that each chip that's connected to this J daisy chain is called a tap, which is going to be important when configuring the software. So, first thing I had to do was find a uh, JTAG cable that I could use. Uh, I ended up purchasing this uh, Alamex ARM USB, which had serial and USB capabilities. I bought it on a whim just because it was 50 bucks. Uh, and then I used o open OCD software. It was open source, and it supports the cable that I had purchased already. And the key point was that it had the ability to auto-discover auto taps. I didn't have to configure anything. It would attempt to auto-determine if there's any JTAG chips that are communicating on these pads. Um, and reading through the documentation, two key points stood out. It was one that it can reliably determine the tap ID, but unreliably determine the IR LEN, which is instruction register length, which I'll talk about later. Um, so the methodology that I was using in order to try to determine what pins are, should be plugged into where was just Google searching common JTAG pinouts that had two sets of seven, seven uh, had 14 pins and two sets of seven rows, two, whatever. Um, so the first thing, if there's, if there's any data coming out of any of these pins, it's definitely not JTAG because I know that JTAG doesn't, doesn't transmit any data without an external clock. Then uh, I would try this common pinout and then flip the thing 180 degrees and then try it again, uh, power on the device, and then start this open OCD software to see it, if it can auto-discover a specific tap on the device or any taps. So do you guys remember these... Uh, <laughs> These games that are the games, quote unquote games, that are sitting in um, doctors' offices. Well, this is how I felt trying to uh, trying to plug these things in between the the cable and the board. I, for some reason, I could not wrap my head around how to get. <laughs> I don't know, whatever. Anyways, once I finally uh, completed that game and I got the pinouts correct, I started the open OC, open OCD software, and as you can see in the yellow, it said that it auto discovered a tap and it gives it a specific expected ID, which is some random number that I have no idea what I'm doing right now, and then the instruction length said two, and then there's an error. So I started using that ID in Google search, uh, that expected ID, and it turns out that that ID matched exactly to the Xilinx chip that was near that set of pinouts, uh, to, the, to the model number that was on that chip. So the next step was to configure the open OCD uh, software to communicate with with that chip, and there's four different four different things that you need 
um, in order to do that. First is the ex expected ID, which it already gave me. Um, then the IR length, the IR capture, and the IR mask, which I originally just started throwing some numbers at it and seeing what, what it did. Everything was turning out to be an error. And then I, I started reading uh, about another concept that's kind of hand in hand with JTAG, which is BSDL, which is just a configuration file that uh, tells, w tells a developer how you can communicate over JTAG to a specific chip. So JTAG is a very loose protocol. There's, there's minimal that's required for it to be implemented. And developers, or the chip manufacturers, implement all these additional functionalities that is not necessarily public knowledge. But fortunately for me, the Xilinx people allow you to download it for free, this, this BSDL file, with just signing up uh, on their web page. And I saw in this file there was one, uh, these two, two things that I needed to configure the tab. The instruction length, instruction length, and the instruction capture. Which the instruction length is bleh. the instruction length is six, and the instruction capture is uh, xxxx01. So, modified my configuration file to add that, uh, the tap in there. And this time I booted up, or I started the OpenOCD software, and um, there's no errors, which I thought one step further. This is awesome. Next thing I did was, uh, so OpenOCD works in a client-server uh, mode where. The, when you're starting open OCD, it opens up a port that you can tell that to, and then another port that you can connect via GDB and send commands to. So the first thing I did was throw, send this command JTAG init, which again, didn't throw any errors. It gave me the specific tap that it found, the manufacturer number, the part number, and the version number. And I, so I'm like, yes, I'm on the right path. However, if I would have thought about this before taking all the time of understanding JTAG, I would have realized that the only thing that I'm going to be able to communicate with is the Xilinx FPGA, and that's got no flash, no operating system, and the only thing that I may be able to do is reprogram it. So again, it's kind of a fail on my part, but not because, uh, it was just because I simply didn't think. I was, I, was getting ex I was getting excited and being impatient. So in this case, I feel like the debug pins beat me out here. I learned a lot about JTAG, and um, however, Again, no closer to my goal of actually gaining access to the device. So switching back to, switching gears now to the software level, I looked at all of the pins and the only one that I had uh, any sort of path to gaining access to the device was the JP1 set of pins that ended up bringing me to a Linux boot prompt. Um, so I bought this 3v3 USB FTDI cable that allowed me just to connect through uh, a screen terminal session at a specific baud rate, and I was able to interact with, with the device. Um, what I was doing, though, when, when, when powering on the device was I was plugging in the device, then starting the, the terminal session, and so I was missing the whole beginning part of the boot procedure, and I was just getting to this login prompt. I was like, what, how, I can, I'm not, I tried guessing, obviously root, root, didn't work, but um, after a while, I, I ended up keeping this, the terminal session open and then powering on the device, and I noticed this. Uh, the beginning of U-boot is, and it paused for like two seconds that you wouldn't really notice, but after booting it about 50 times, you could actually see this. And uh, number four, and this is actually how it's spelled on the device, I did, it's not a typo, uh, enter boot command line interface. So next time I powered it on, I continuously pressed four, and it dropped me into this uh, bootloader interface a U-boot bootloader interface. And me not knowing much of anything about bootloaders, I started reading once again. Uh, and there's a help command that showed me the available commands that I have on this specific device. And after enumerating all the commands that were available, the only thing that I was really going to be helpful to me was uh, this MD command, which is memory display. So there's a flash chip that's com that is somehow connected, and I can read data off of that. So my, I my idea was to use that to dump data log it using screen, and then create a Ruby script that uh, trans transfers that data into a binary file. Now, thankfully, doing, when, when, re when Googling around on specifics for this device, there was an exploitworkshop.org. I don't even think the web page is up anymore, but they gave me this memory layout, represent, or memory layout of this specific device. It actually wasn't even up when I found it. I actually I saved the file locally from a Google cache page. But as you can see, there's a four megabyte flash memory address location, so BFC through C00. Um, that was my goal. That was what I wanted to start pulling off and start trying to analyze because as you can see in the bottom, there's U-boot image, Linux kernel image, and some extras. So 
I know this is booting Linux, and it looks like Linux is on this portion of memory somewhere, so my goal was to try to uh, use that to my advantage. So um, the memory display command literally just outputs it straight to the screen like a hex editor would. So I had to write a script that you know, took into account endianness and took into account specific memory address locations and was able to dump this and then turn it into a file. And then that file was nothing. It was just a set of data after running file in the command. However, reading a bunch of blogs, the, this, is, this is like a common path that people go down when trying to reverse firmware images. So the next thing I wanted to look at was what can I gain from this big blob of data, this four megabyte flash set of data that I have sitting in front of me. Um, and doing this, there was three tools that always, it was, it was a common workflow with these three tools. The first one is strings, and the second one is file, which I'm assuming everyone knows. And the last one was this uh, tool, I don't know who wrote it, but it's called binwalk. And what it does is it steps through a file, and, and at each specific byte in that file, it will essentially run the file command from that byte onto the end of the file. Uh, it doesn't actually run it, run the file command, it has its own implementation, but uh, that's essentially what it does to see if there's a file located within a, some big blob of data. So the first thing that I did was this, with the, the full four megabyte flash was a run file and it didn't give me anything. The strings didn't give me anything either. However, when running the bin, bin what was it, bin dump? Yeah, bin dump on it, uh, you can see that, that, that representation at the bottom, there's a bunch of LZMA partitions and two uh, UMIG Linux images, which directly uh, related back to that exploit workshop thing that I was looking at, the memory address layout. So, the first thing that I did was pull all those LZMA uh, partitions out using DD um, and then try to un-LZMA them. The only one that actually successfully decompressed was this last one, which I call LZMA4. Running file on that just says another set of data. However, running strings on it gave me one step closer, and it's showing you know, actual real strings and data that's, going, that's, coming, that's in, this, in this file. Um, again, the next thing that I ran was binwalk, and I see a ton of LZMA partitions, or I call them partitions, parts of, parts of this file and some squash file system images. Um, when reading this, I was reading, or when doing this, I was reading a blog post about someone reversing, uh, reversing a router firmware and they were, saying, they were explaining a trick of, of they found a squash file system partition that existed within, an, within a file and they were able to modify the header to successfully uh, unsquash that file system. So that's where I originally started focusing. Uh, everything failed. I, I spent a couple of days trying to get that working. However, if I would have just read this once again, I was too excited to trying to move too quickly. You can see all the created dates on this are way in the future, which to me makes me think that that's definitely not anything of, of use. It's a false positive of the binwalk tool. So the next thing that I did was pulled out every single one of those LZMA partitions manually. And uh, again, the last one was the only one that decompressed. So I call this 4.18 because it's the second, it's the 18th partition that was in that file. Running file and it says uh, something ASCII, I didn't, I, I just said, I saw ASCII and kept moving forward. Running strings on it showed me this specific format of the file where it looked like there's some ID number, then an executable, and then possibly the contents of that executable. And running binwalk on it showed uh, a ton of binaries, some more LZMA stuff, um, but I felt like I was on the right path. So after Googling around a little bit, I determined that this was uh, actually a CPIO archive um, based on the format of the file. However, if I would have just read, again, the, the file command, it told me exactly what this was. Uh, so that was a waste of a couple of days, but now I know how to move forward. So running CPIO, I could, I could see a list of files, um, which, however, CPIO has a limitation on it when it comes to extracting files from the archive. They go to their exact location. There's no way of putting it into uh, uh, like a reference directory. There's no, there's no way of actually uh, of giving it a root directory of where it should place all these files. It just places them, like if it's, Etsy password, it will place it on Etsy password on your machine. However, there was a nice little flag called dash "-r", which allowed me to interactively rename all 208 of these files. And I did that manually as well, that was awesome. Um, <laughs> and yes, after doing all this, weeks later, people were like, you know, you could have done that a lot easier, you know? I was like, yeah, I know. 
I was too excited. I wanted to keep going. Um, so the next, the next thing, so I've got all these files now in a directory, and it's, it's a boot file system, so I wanted to try to start reversing them. To try to, my, again, my goal is to gain access to, the, to this device, and all I have is um, up to a Linux boot prompt, or a Linux login prompt. So I started reversing the applications that were in here, and the, there was three main focuses of the reversing. Um, first were these uh, scripts that were in the sbin directory, uh, which were part of the boot procedure, and that I could relate the strings that were being printed out from there to the strings that existed in the scripts. And then I also found that a lot of these binaries were using eval, um, which you'll see later it directly re directly relates to the boot procedure and these scripts. So, on a kind of a side note, um, there's within that memory address layout, there was also something that was defined as pico config, which had a, basically a configuration that you could be that could be read from the the bootloader um, that had a few things of interest in there. One was tamper proof, which was a binary representation of the plugs that were on the front and the back of the board. So, presumably, I can pull those out, overwrite tamper proof to all zeros, and the device should still work. Uh, I'm not sure if the uh, if it's random for each new device or what, but there's also the ability to put it in a learn mode, and again, would pr presumably learn what the pin um, the pin uh, configuration is. There's also a node in there that shows, so the Pico config is just like a, a key value pair in a tree. Uh, I'll show you what it looks like next slide, but there's also what looked like a firm, uh, specifying a firmware image on a TFTP server at one, some 192.168 address, which was confusing to me because how was it getting to that, uh, that IP address? And then the last part was that there's a firewall node that I directly resembled exactly what I was seeing upon boot. Now, this is what the, the, Pico, the top part of this, this uh, slide is the Pico config and specifically the firewall portion of it. As you can see, these, um, the port protocol and the destination IP address are directly related to what's happening at this IP tables command. So again, I don't have access to this device and I was thinking if somehow I can override that and run a command, I may be able to do some sort of command injection to get access to this device. Um, it turns out looking at one of the executables that's reading this memory address location and um, uh, reading the configuration file and, and calling these eval functions is it's actually calling eval sh c and then whatever IP table string that it determines from that memory address. And as you can see in the top one, uh, the comment, it's actually, you can see it's a format string, so there's a percent %s in there. So my idea was that if I can somehow override the IP address to run some sort of command, I may be able to gain access to, to this device. The first test of what I was just trying to do is ping something. just or do it an echo of just seeing if I can get some sort of output. Um, so going back to U-Boot, I was able, not only was able to read the memory on the flash chip, I was also able to write the memory. However, any attempt that I was trying to do to modify this Pico config portion of memory was failing. Um, nothing was working. I would, I would write to it and then read the exact same bit back and it, would, it just wouldn't change. I had, no, I, I had no idea what was going on. Then I noticed this thing called protect, one of the commands. Um, Specifically, in one, there's a print environmental variables, which is a set of environmental variables and commands. So I saw this command u underscore b, and the first thing it says was protect off. I was like, awesome, let's run it. Bad idea. <laughs> uh, if you actually continue to read the command, it proceeds to erase the entire flash chip as well. Um, so I now had a second brick on my hand. Again, called up customer service and. Uh, said, I don't know what happened. Again, 30 minutes of debugging. Uh, this time they didn't say anything about a tamper flag, but they kept asking me if uh, there was a power surge in my apartment because there was, there was only one light that was just solid, which I assume means that you have a brick. And uh, I mean, I, I made up some stories like, yeah, yeah, there was a storm last night. It probably was that. <laughs> Anyways, I couldn't totally convince them that I didn't know what was going on, and it was like two hours wasted of my day, so I ended up hanging up with them, and I know, I, I know from the last call that they take notes about everything that you're talking about. So what I did was just go to the, went to the store and said the same story as before. Yeah, I talked to the people at customer service. They said I could just come in and replace it. Ladies were like, all right, let me look up the notes, and she just like read the first few sentences. She was like, all right, perfect, here you go. Um, however, 
The only, <laughs> the only problem was that uh, they didn't have any in stock, so I had to wait. Uh, they had to get one shipped to me. Now, while doing this, I remember looking at one of the bin dumps before, and there was a Linux kernel image in there. So I wanted to start focusing on anything else I possibly could while I'm waiting for this device. Now, also while doing this, I sent uh, Etsy password. I tried to crack it with John the Ripper. Uh, it was it was in this really weird format I had never seen before, which was it was just a 13 character string where the hash is supposed to be. Uh, someone explained to me what it was before. It was some old school hashing mechanism. Um, so I really didn't have any faith because I didn't think this was a, a legitimate Etsy password file. I thought it was somehow dynamically being generated when the when the device boots up. Um, so I, I sent that. It was just running in the background on one of my servers at home. Uh, and then I moved forward to looking at this Linux kernel image. Uh, that's the binned up output, as you can see, image type OS kernel image. Uh, I found out based on some of the other information that was being used uh, or that was being displayed upon boot that uh, this is the specific configuration that you needed to load it in IDA. The start address is uh, 8. The RAM size is essentially the size of the file. And then from there, you'd have to go to the specific address location that it starts running instructions from and have, it, have IDA start analyzing it. So after doing that, I, will, I got to a place where I have all these functions, which is what's shown on the left, but none of them are named. They're just, I mean, I'm one step closer, but it doesn't really give me much. I'm not going to go through and analyze every single kernel level function that exists in this, this huge firmware image. But I did also notice that on the right hand screenshot, in the strings portion of IDA, there's what looks like to be function names somewhere in this image, or in this, uh, yeah, in the, in the image that I loaded. So when I started looking at it, specifically I was looking at the mem copy string that's in there. I noticed if you can see on the, the left hand side the highlighted address location of the beginning of where mem, the, the literally the string mem copy starts. I used IDA to search to see if that byte represent, uh, that, that set of bytes existed anywhere else in the image. Turns out in only one other place it existed, which as you, as you can see highlighted on the right, the, the actual byte value is, if you go from the bottom up, 8027CDE8, which directly is the exact um, thing on the left. I thought that this couldn't just be a coincidence. Um, so I kept looking for, further. And after it, it was also the next set of bytes was the exact start of one of the functions. So I kind of made an assumption that it's either a function and a, a function and then a string, or a, the string and then the function, and some of, some of that order. So um, I ended up writing a, a Ruby script that pulled out all these these memory address locations from the file and created uh, an IDA script that would um, load these memory address locations or load this out, the string literals into IDA and point them to specific memory address locations. Um, after doing that, I got a partial representation of what the kernel functions look like. But um, while doing this, I, I got an email from Corey Benninger, who uh, he works at Intrepidus Group, and he, he pointed me to this uh, GPL portion of the, the, uh, the pamphlet that they give you with the, with the device. And it basically says, um, there's a bunch of GPL software in here. If you want copies of it, send $9.99 for shipping and handling to this specific address. Uh, oh, and by the way, if you have any questions, you can email us here. So I sent an email to them saying, I don't want to uh, send you $9.99. Will you just send me the files? And I just waited. While doing this, I still didn't have the device yet back from, from, from the, I almost slipped, from the company that I was using. <laughs> um, but. Uh, fortunately, John the Ripper succeeded. After seven days, the root SSH and SSHD passwords both cracked. We were the same passwords. It ended up being seven characters, all lowercase. Um, so now I know that when I get this device, I'd have root on it. So I was really excited. Um, before I got the device, I also got an email back from the company, and they sent me two files, or they sent me links to two files. The first one was this DPH-151, which was the full boot chain for the operating system that I'm looking at, literally a tutorial on how to build a firmware image on Ubuntu for this device. And then um, uh, some, this other IP access AP, which is uh, some of the open source software for another chip that's on this, on this device. Now, when I actually got the device back, uh, I was able to log in and start, start playing around and, try, and understanding more of exactly what this was doing. And um, 
what happens when the, when the device boots, it sends a GPIO signal to another processor, which they refer to as Pico, uh, that causes that chip to boot. That sends a DHCP request back to the chip that I am actually in, which they, they refer to as the router. Uh, and so, and it requests an IP address from this slash 30 address. Um, then it configures IP tables to forward a specific set of ports to that private IP address. So, so within, this, the, within that piece of hardware, it's already NATing inside of itself somehow. Um, uh, none of those ports were open that were being forwarded to the second processor, but um, it uses IP tables to do that. So it, presumably they, they should be open at some point. Uh, another thing was there's IP server service running, which allowed for interprocess communication between the Pico, uh, the Pico processor and the router processor to ask for things internally like uptime and uh, has this been tampered with and whatnot. Then there's a wizard uh, service that was running that allowed for remote commands, remote commands from uh, over multicast from third parties. So somehow. They, the, the company was able to have the ability to perform actions on my device through this, um, this wizard, wizard function. The last one I looked at was the CFG underscore flash, which uh, after looking at it, there was a, this thing called config flash, dash, so it's dash S for save, dash N for the name, which is backdoor, and dash V for one, um, which after booting that, or after sending that command and booting the device up, it binds Telnet to 0.0.0. .0, so now I don't need to actually plug in a physical cable to this device anymore. I have access to it uh, with just through Telnetting of whatever IP address it, it, it requests from my router. Now, um, the, uh, the fail overflow a couple months ago, I did a blog post on this device. And uh, noted that there, within, this, within that wizard application, there was a uh, backdoor packet command line which allows someone to send raw commands that are literally executed with eval just straight up. Um, and it, it's obviously intended functionality. The developers meant to do this. However, now that it's public knowledge, I'm assuming that they're going to maybe take it out in the next version. So I started looking f further because. Um, in order to gain access to this device, the first time I still need to plug in, uh, I still physically need to plug into the device in order to run that backdoor command. So I, I wanted to be able to get a device, plug it in, and not have to run anything in order to gain access to it. So uh, I found this other backdoor packet load serial number function that it calls. And remember the command injection with the IB table stuff? Well, it turns out it exists here as well. Um, I see it, it calls this CS client um, set serial number and percent %s, which comes from the packet that's being sent. So if you just use backticks or dollar sign parentheses, you can, and then it calls eval sh. So it basically calls shsc this specific command. So you could use this to uh, send one packet to the device to start the back door, unplug the device, plug it back in, and the next time it boots up, you're going to have a uh, telnet bound to its public IP address or its local IP address. Um, so that's it. I feel like I completely destroyed this device, um, and uh, I was able to gain access to it physically and able to get root, and then also have a soft rooting device of it, uh, soft rooting functionality of it, so I don't even need to pull it apart anymore. Um, so the answer to the question, how many bricks did it take, and it only took two. I was hoping there was going to be more, but I didn't actually have to pay for any of them, which is good. Um, <laughs> I wanted to give some thanks out to uh, Raj Umadas, Jeremy Allen, Corey Benninger of Intrepidus Group, and uh, they helped me a lot throughout this project. Kurt Rosenfeld and Ad Andrew Zonenberg, and then finally Travis Goodspeed. Uh, that's it. Uh, again, the slides are in white paper are located on the IP address at the bottom. They'll also be on the Madasana research page at some point. My name, my email, and my Twitter. So does anybody have any questions? All right. Well, thank you guys. No, wait. Oh. Unfortunately, the router. Uh, so the question was: I got access to the device. Am I going to do? Uh, was I able to do anything useful? Um, the router portion of the device, which is what I talked about here. No, there's nothing useful that can happen into it. In it, however.
The Pico portion is where all the fun stuff happens, uh, which I've also been able to gain, uh, gain access to, however, not enough time to talk about it in this presentation. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right, thanks again.